Did it. Doctor moving them. The MC of this program, Matina, and all those who are associated uh, with this webinar. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to step into the uh, this virtual world to join you all in the webinar on culture <laughs> and myth. Doctor, moving on. Civilization can be divided this culture. program. You see, the civilization is defined. It is established only if it has a culture. And this culture is actually a compilation of the best practices of a group, of a civilization. And if this culture is a manual, the user's guide for a civilization filled with do's and don'ts, and then myths are the texts, they are the multi narratives. So, in this period, it is a great pleasure and an opportunity to, to talk to you about culture and myth, especially, especially in the land of Pradora of principles, political myths, cultural heritage. You see, this is a great pleasure and the need of the hour to talk on the topic culture and a myth. See there, some of you may wonder why this first cover page has Lord Ganesha, Vigneshwara, along with Periyar and Gautama Buddha in it. We will answer it. We will answer it. But the very idea, the very objective of this webinar is to seek the truth as the classical Tamil couplet says, read in English, whatever meaning is heard from whoever's mouth, true knowledge is to seek from it the truth. Yepurul yar yar vai ketpinum apurul meipurul kanbadarivu. That is what the other day, the other day during the, the other day, during the the other day during the corona period i was so surprised and even shocked greatly amused uh, to see a scene telecast in some uh, tv channel you see a person was crossing on the street he was stopped by a policeman for not wearing the mask. And what happened was immediately that person took the grocery bill from his pocket and put it on his mouth and tried to imitate wearing mask. I started wondering what happened. You see, even if that person is a half witted human being, then what made him, what forced him to take something from his pocket and put it against his mouth to obey this order, command, you see. Then Claude Levi-Strauss came to my aid. Claude Levi-Strauss says, the Belgian-born French cultural anthropologist says, the wise man doesn't give the right answers. He poses the right questions. The aim of cultural studies is to examine its objectives and practices. We should remember that deconstructing a myth is not to destroy it, but to demystify it and understand it in its complexity as the collective unconscious and the language, the type of language 
to quote Roland Barthes, you see, a type of language of a group of people. It is also a kind of cryptic, secret language, you see. So, these myths which are carried over to the cultural do's and don'ts, these myths are very dense. Even an iconoclast like Buddha or Periya, when they break these myths, when they demystify gods, the guy humanity needs someone like Buddha to be idolized and made into a myth and worshipped. That is what the Zen stories tell us. So in that context, it is imperative for us to understand like language, the language which has a phoneme, a morpheme, a semine, or in layman's terms, the letter, a unit of letter creating syllables, and the unit of syllables creating words, and the unit of words creating phrases, clauses, resultant to uh, the sentences, paragraphs, so on and so forth. Like that, exactly like that. Myth also has its smallest meaningful constituent unit, which like phoneme or morpheme, we can call mythene. So myth is not a single entity. It is not essentially one. It is a compilation. It is what in Tamil, in Tamil there is an archaic expression, Thunmam. And at the same time, there is a layman's expression, Kattu Kadai, a bundle of stories. You see, this Kattu Kadai, a bundle of stories, is a very well organized, compiled thing. However exotic a myth may appear, ultimately a myth is humane. A myth addresses and represents humanity. So when we attempt to deconstruct a myth into its smallest meaningful units, then what happens is each and everything has a meaning of its own. That is why the scholars of cultural study, again like Claude Levi Strauss, the Belgian born French cultural anthropologist, say, they say that don't try to identify similarities between cultures, try to identify similarities between myths from various regions, various parts of the world. In that sense, if you take this Lord Ganesha myth, as Grish Karnad in his Hayavadana says, it appears to be for Westerners a personification of imperfection, abnormality, an elephant head on a human body, a broken tusk with a cracked belly. From whichever point of view you look at him, he appears to be a personification of imperfection. But this Lord Ganesha is supposed to be the god of perfection. You see, whether one is a Saivite or a Vaishnavite, for both these people, Lord Ganesha appears as the first and foremost invocating a deity. So what is this Lord Ganesha mythologically? Why this and how? this Lord Ganesha entered into the rich cultural heritage. You see, you see, the elephant has always been a primitive wonder, whether it is uh, jungle book stories or it is the great novel Veera Yuga Nayagan Velpari written by Sagiti Academy Award winner Sue Vengadesan, West or East, the elephant has always been the maker of forests. The elephant has always been the producer of the natural resources. 
So this elephant which produces everything is so humble. You see, I have often seen, many of us would have seen the mahout, the elephant tamer, the keeper of the elephant, very peacefully sleeping between the legs of an elephant, his elephant. This elephant, we know, it has a habit of swinging its legs. What will happen if it swings its leg? The mahout knows. The elephant also knows that is the wonder here. So the elephant keeps still because the mahout is sleeping. The question is how this elephant, very powerful wild animal, can be so domesticated like a child. And this combination certainly would have created instilled wonderment in the primitive man. That is why one must be like an elephant. So if you are so much, if you are absolutely composed and in control of your elements, your humors, then one can overcome all the hurdles. That is why this Lord Ganesha is also called as Vigneshwara, the destroyer of all obstacles. So this is a myth. This myth talks to us about the cultural practices. You see the do's and don'ts. That is why we consider myth as an important phenomenon. All right. I always tell my students, even though this great uh, webinar is visited and has been being listened by scholars, uh, almost international, international, it is always better to start very unassumingly. So let us start with the definition, description, classification, comparison, and illustration all along. What does the etymology of culture say? The etymology of culture can be traced back to its Greek origin, cultus. That actually is a verb, collier. This collier means to care, to create, to preserve. So, what is it for a man? Or rather, what was it for a man in its origin? The care, to care for one's land, care for one, to care for one's property to care for one's family. So this care for one's so land, how people became, then the yeah, nomadic tribe became a cultivator, finding a settlement. This, cult, this culture would have become cultivation. Even much later, even, much, even today, for example, we use this expression cultivate, not only for land, a physical entity, but also metaphorically. For example, in Shakespeare's Macbeth, the play opens in a heed where we meet the three witches. You see, heed, how a heed is, um, becomes a signifier. You see, a heed signifies an uncultivated tract which metaphorically refers to an uncultivated mind, rather an unspiritual mind. So this cultivation is not just a physical activity. It is emotional, spiritual. It needs a lot of countless silken ties of love and thought, as Robert Frost would have said, you see. So protecting oneself and family, and protecting the places of worship wouldn't have been different for the primitive man. Because the primitive man's life, the art of living, should be understood as oikos. Oikos means household. So, household for a primitive man, in Tamil they call it samsari. In English, 
They call it husbandry. You see, Corinthian says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's husbandry, God's building. You see, so the man, the place, she's God, everything becomes integrated. From this oikos, as a prefix, eco, you see, later became economics or ecology because nomos means management, ology, we all know, ology means study of. So, ecology means study of environment and economics, household management. So, what was the art of Household management for the primitive man. That's the question. You see, husbandry means taking care of, protecting, nurturing self, family, animals, fowls, land, God, gods, and places of veneration. You see, even today, among the African Maasai tribe, that is a well-preserved tribe. If, if there is an error, a mistake, a crime, or some misdeed committed by a member of the Maasai community, instead of punishing the man, they would always punish his animal. You see, because the animal is not a separate entity for a Maasai. For a Maasai, an animal is part of so husbandry, you see, Emerson, beautifully, Ralph Waldo Emerson succinctly states it in his poem, Terminus, which is a, a sister poem for his oversoul or Brahma, Brahma. You see, he says, if you have committed a mistake, you see, if you want to curse, don't curse the sire. You see, don't curse the maker. If you, if you want to curse, curse your forefathers, the bad husbands of the fire. Here, fire means for resources, elements, one's personality. So, the primitive man, the oikos, was an integrated oikos. Today, we have compartmentalized everything. We have made an individual playing many roles, of course, but often we hear our family members reminding us not to bring our profession into the household or a place of worship is considered totally different from a movie hall or a theater of drama or, a, or, or, or any entertainment place, any entertainment place. But for a primitive man, everything was integrated. A primitive man not only worked as a family for his livelihood, his way of living in itself was integrated. Before work, for example, before setting forth for his work to earn food for his family, to hunt or to cultivate. He would have offered prayer to his gods and his form of worship would have been singing and dancing. So his culture was a fusion of self, others, profession, leisure as well as worship. You see, leisure today may mean passive leisure, but in those days, leisure was an active leisure. Holiday was not just a day of the work. In fact, work was considered self-centered. The self and his family. Whereas leisure was often associated with sacrifice, worship. Where there is a worship without sacrifice. So, Holiday was a holy day then. So, for a primitive man, unlike today, his entire life was one single entity. So, 
his myth was a pile of multiple narratives it can address his self his family members his land his fowl that is why i put lord ganesha's image in the cover page you see that is an animal that is a child you see the big belly the legs of lord ganesha or really like children you see at the same time she is very powerful she has the wisdom the wisdom perhaps the primitive wisdom of an elephant you see so the myths which we call an integrated however exotic however exotic when we dissect them when we deconstruct them we will understand each and every mythim very meaningful the word myth in itself has originated from the term mythos the greek term mythos what is mythos it's very surprising that the word mythos the etymology mythos covers an entire range of communication from word or to the story you see the entire range of communication like the word epic you see which contains both history and myth so as a word myth is a peculiar encoded language spoken by a group of people it is encoded language that is why people like stuart hall wants us to decode people like roland bach wants uh, to decode no civilization is devoid of their myths as a kind of cryptic language in fact if there is no myth that cannot be a civilization true true just look back go in go back in time to trace the evolution of american civilization maybe the white american civilization the dominantly predominantly privileged white american civilization how did it start it started with the myth when the europeans the explorers the fortune seekers the settlers you see when they were searching for the land to settle in they found the islands of america some of the names they have given would really be telling stories one state could be called is called new found land the other more significantly virginia you see so when they saw the virgin land they thought certainly undoubtedly they thought that the paradise they had lost elsewhere now they have refound they can reestablish the paradise they lost that is why the early american settlers were very intolerant which resulted in the jonathan calvinistic puritanism attaining got getting the infamous a notorious name the calvinistic puritanism getting the name diabolic puritanism why because the beginning myth the original myth was adam myth the american adam when the americans the young americans the literary minded americans the humanist among them were so disillusioned with the intolerance of their elders what did they do they looked around for other myths and came the gold myth so later it even became machine god 
money god you see so if only a myth can be replaced by can replace another myth the myth cannot be deleted you see you need another myth to occupy the place of the myth which you want to push to the background so no civilization is devoid can be devoid of their myths as a language i have already told you that it has mythemes you see for example the ganesh myth or the shiva myth as a story it is a multiple narrative myth has its literal as well as symbolic values you see the primitive wisdom in making certain myths as totems and some other myths as taboos totem means something we worship whereas taboos or forbidden you see this shiva myth in fact a western scientist or an anthropologist or um an ethnologist if he research the symbol of lord shiva she could easily find out that uh, shiva shiva linga stands for phallic worship and the native uh, may be a saivite or a hindu may be agitated but we must realize that any statement on sex is a liberation a statement of liberation you see so they had in those days very totemic you see as a as a symbol which identifies the domestic life the symbol which is made of very minute uh, units the mythemes you see and when it was personified into shiva we have numerous mythemes for example the a uh, illustration the image the picture you find on the uh, ppt could tell you that from the top of the head flows water and the head carries the crescent moon and on the forehead uh, you have the sacred ash smeared and in the middle of the forehead there is fire and you have the eyes fully concentrating on spiritual quest and around shiva's neck you have the snake fully poised see and shiva's represents here as an illuminating light an illuminating light you see the snake around his neck tells us of how composed the most powerful of your human instinct should be if you are all tamil story readers read a tamil short story titled kurangugal in english monkeys written by an eminent short story writer uh, sundara ramasamy sundara ramasamy available in the collection pallam see snake here represents almost many hindu amits they have this snake the snake is very puff in freudian terms as powerful as libido the sexual urge and the snake must be controlled what is necessary must be put under control what is primitive what is impulsive what is the most powerful must be kept under control and at the same time you also have other other many other many other stories for snake as a symbol and such stories take us to the taboos 
in the culture. For example, the myth states that once Manishas, the human beings, the angels, devas, the divine entities, and asuras, the demons, all joined hands together, try to bring out the divine nectar from the wash, the great wash. And they were so ambitious that they did not stop churning the wash. And at a point, either the snake or the version itself spat venom. You see, anything in excess must be poisonous. That is what the story says. And when this venom sprouted out or overflowed, see, what happened? It would have destroyed the entire cosmic universe. So Lord Shiva appeared and swallowed the venom. And since his wife, his loving wife, Parvati was by his side, she not letting his husband, a wife is a wife, to be hurt by this venom. You see, she grabbed his throat and stopped venom from entering into his body. You see, so his throat became blue throat. So Shiva becomes the blue throated god, Tiru Nila Kandar, they say. And on the other side, you have, in the PPT, you can see that on the other side, you have this apple myth, the biblical myth. You see, when tempted by Satan, you see, Adam and Eve, you see, who ate the apple first? I don't want to make any comment on that. You see, or who influenced whom? I don't want to make a comment on that. But what the Bible says is, he picked the apple and influenced Adam to eat it along with her. You see, when they ate it, the knowledge, the forbidden knowledge, knowledge, the type of knowledge was there, which was forbidden in those days according to the Bible. You see, so the forbidden knowledge, the taboo entered into their lives and they suffered forever. That is why T.S. Eliot calls Adam a millionaire who became a beggar, you see. But this Adam was a blue-eyed Adam, you see. He was so innocent that he wanting to satisfy his Eve, who, uh, who in turn was influenced by the snake. You see, they were innocent people. So the blue you see, stands here both for the venom and also for the innocence, also for this innocence. And it is, it is funny that today you call the throat Adam's apple, Adam's apple. So Lord Shiva also has Adam's apple, you see. So what the mythologist, what the cultural um, analyst those the exponents of culture studies advocate is that don't try to compare the cultures. Don't try to find the similarity between two cultures. Identify the similarities between two myths. The myths may belong to East or West, but there are certain universal units which we can call homologous, you see. James Fraser's Golden Bow or Jesse L. Weston's From Rituals to Romance are replete with such mythemes, such homologous constituent myths which are prevalent all over the world. For example, for example, in the myth of the great deluge. This great deluge myth appears both in the East and in the West. Here, for example, I have given only two. I can take it as far as to Jewish tribe, to Islam, or to Buddhism, 
I can carry it. But for your convenience, for the students, I am focusing only on the two myths. You see, the great deluge is the unifying consonant, you see, constituent myth in these two myths. In Bible, it is Ark, Noah's Ark, you see. And then in Hindu mythology, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know whether I can call it Hindu mythology or so, you see. Um, many would say, I too believe, I too believe as a Marxist humanist, I too believe that Hinduism is a federation. Hinduism is a banner later appeared. I can't say, uh, sorry if I sound political, you see, I can't say that Hinduism existed in India at the very beginning. You see, if we trace back to Indian history, Indus Valley civilization is something different from uh, what you call Hindu today. Um, no quarrel about that. No quarrel about that. Later on, Hinduism as a federation started assimilating, as Roland Barthes would say, assimilating various components, various practices, various myths, uh, various cultures found in this big land, India. And they gave the banner uh, Hinduism, I could say, I could say, there are so many uh, changes which have happened. For example, the Dravidian uh, race, which uh, was here, which was here, as the historians say, as the anthropologists say, uh, the ethn ethnologists say, uh, the, the Dravidian civilization, the Dravidian race, which was here originally where they were just seed pickers and food or fruit gatherers. You see, only when the Aryan race entered, they introduced a horse and steel. They were huntsmen. Then naturally many things they entered, only men entered. They may have brought their women later or here would have happened misogynism or inter racial a family system, and so there is a mixture. So let us not get dwell deep into that. Let us get back to these two myths. You see, going both these myths, you find an ark, you see, the great deluge, and God's significant role. And this significant role in Hindu mythology, in Vaishnavite mythology, it is called Matsyavadar, you see. In Vaishnavite um, mythology, there was a king who was called Satyavrata. Satyavrata. Like Noah there in the Bible, he was Satyavrata. You see, and the Satyavrata, once when he was fetching water to drink, he found a small fish there. So he put the fish back home, he found uh, the fish. So he put the fish in a small, um, small vessel. Suddenly the fish grew big. So he took the fish to a pond and put it there. And again it grew bigger than the, uh, too big for the pond to uh, have it. Then Satyavrata realized that it couldn't have been an ordinary fish. It is something else, some divine spirit. So he offered his prayers to that fish and the fish uh, emerged as Lord Vishnu asking Satyavrata to build a boat because this is the time of great deluge and the whole world would be washed down and he wanted Satyavrata. He took Satyavrata, the God took Satyavrata and his Aikas on a cosmic tour, on a cosmic tour and there the Sastra, the Dharma evolved. There are so many other stories involved in this. You see, I'm not getting into that. I, what my focus is the ark and the fish. If you take the fish, then you can find this fish myth. You can associate this fish with uh, Judaism, Buddhism. The Kong they use in Buddhist monasteries 
appear like a fish. You see, they are in the shape of the fish. And the fish is associated in uh, Greek mythology with Venus, you see, as a, a regenerating love, reunion, and multiplication of human generation. And fish stands for that. And in Roman Catholic uh, practices, on Friday, the Irish Roman Catholics, Irish Catholics, they eat fish on Fridays. So the fish is a very strong homologue, which you can find in many myths. So the question we have to ask today is, you see, the most important question, you see, Albert Camus would have asked the question, what is suicide? Why man dies? She had called G. Jung, asked the question, what dream am I living? Because this dream shapes my, my, my life, my living hours, you see. Myth is collective unconscious. If it can be spoken out, if it can be discussed in public, then it becomes a cultural discourse which can be registered in any book of scripture, obviously, or in any book of uh, history, obviously. As Sorry for the interruption. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, this is the problem with technology. This is something we get used during this lockdown period. One, I read uh, a news from the Hindu. You see, it says this Tamil writer, J. Mohan, has written 69 short stories in this lockdown period. And all these 69 short stories are based on myths, you see. That is very surprising. That's very surprising. Because when one is alone, solitude is very important for a human being, you see. Man, like Anton Elephants, is a social being. It is true. 
we are governed by our society. But as Jung says, you see, in our in our loneliness, in our solitude, our nobility comes out. And how does this nobility come out in solitude? Jung uses an excellent image. See, by accepting darkness, the patient has not, to be sure, changed it into light. When we accept darkness, when we accept the presence of the other side in whatever way we use, we talk about staunch believers. Here, I must make a reference to my professor, my late professor, who was a myth for me. Even though I lived by his side, you see, he was meant for me, Dr. Paul L. Love. And the last Christmas message he gave to us, to me as well as to my students, was this. After the message was over, let me go to the message later. After the message was over, I, I was wondering whether all my students, I was already 55 then, so I, I wondered if all my students would have understood what the grand wise man spoke to these people in his vibrant but quivering voice, you see. But when I came out, I asked, when I asked a couple of students uh, if, they, if they enjoyed the speech, they, in a very whispering voice, they shared the secret with me. Sir, did you notice this? When she said, there are two sides to all of us, she said that one side is a good side and the other side is a not so good side. My student said, sir, did you notice that she never said the evil side? She never said the dog side. This is a staunch faith. You see, this is what we call Christian faith. You see, the Christian faith which says in God's creation there cannot be any evil, but our dreams, the darkness, our secret towers remind us of the darkness within us. You see, he should have said truth is beauty and beauty truth. That's all you know and you need to know like that. You see, since we have something, since we have the other, we need not be so afraid of it. Jung says, by accepting the darkness, the patient has not, to be sure, changed it into light. Albert Camus says, everything is in life. It does not mean anything can happen in life, but it does not mean everything is admitted, everything is permitted. So we don't say by accepting darkness, we are not promoting it. But darkness is there alongside. So a patient, she accepts darkness. She has not changed it into light. But she has kindled definitely the light that illuminates the darkness within. By day, no light is needed. And if you don't know it is night, you won't light one, nor will any light be lit for you unless you have suffered the horrors of darkness. You see, that is what Jung says, the arc in, the archetypes and the collective unconscious. You see, to confront a person with his shadow is to show him his own light. That is a beautiful movie, an excellent movie by... Akira Kurosawa movie is Rajaman. When I first watched that movie, I was reminded of Emerson's statement in the over soul. When you realize the God within, Aham Brahmashmi, the God within, this is possible only in solitude, the God within, you can realize the same light. You see, the Sanskrit slogan goes, Purna Madaka, Purna Madam. Purnamut Purnam Udatsade, Purnasya Purnam Adaya, Purnameva Sishade. 
the light is here here he is there outside also when you take this light when you light this light this light is not spent the light is still there that's what the slogan says like that you see emerson points out when you realize the light within the divine self within you you realize the presence of the same self in others too you see when we realize this light as a universal phenomenon then that is the great revelation of nature he says that is enlightenment you see even marxian theory even marx you see we always understand take the economic principles of marx the political discourses of marx you see that's why i use the expression i am a marxist humanist you see marx like eagles marx also philosophically believes in an enlightenment if religion as periyar says even periyar says if religion is a hindrance to this enlightenment if myth becomes superstition if a culture becomes cult we have to abolish it that all this as inherent humanism myth because myths however exotic they may appear to be today inherently they are humanist because they are the text if the cultures of the if the cultures of the manuals the use words guides the myths or the the cryptic language the text if the myth is rig veda and the culture is other than a veda culture is performative that's what in modern times many myths have been fabricated by the hegemony by the ruling class with the help of the hidden agenda they generate gender color or racial judaizers to name few even food dress and drinking or no exceptions or the smith making roland barthes talks about this beautifully very powerfully in his seminal work mythology which has two parts the second part is myths today there you find roland barth beautifully stating how my champagne became the national myth i too first made a slide having so many pictures taken from the full medium you see how how drinking in india in tamil nadu has become ye ya fan how drinking is heroic how drinking is a sorrow killer how drinking is a carnival you see but no way drink is mentioned as an addiction drink is mentioned as a due humanizing i am not here to discuss the veracity of the of cheeto tellers you see i am not talking about that i am not talking about that in a way i should accept that in a large democracy like india drinking cannot be banned america has tried it the entire america went into the hand of the liquor baron al capone so nobody talks about total banishing of liquor but how the governments or promoting liquor you see how drinking is promoted in various forms how media also join hands with these promoters if the government says that drinking brings revenue i am sorry that revenue which the government earns from drinking from people their people drinking is a pittance i am not getting into the statistics of it uh, that may be saved for some other time now back to what roland bart says about the f- french government promoting champagne 
they promoted champagne not only amidst the white french their major target was the black you see whom they colonized in algiers in french colonies in africa in so many places even the the wheat fields were converted into vineyards to promote champagne so it was veiling it was daylight robbery from the middle class and the poor people what they yearn they spent everything in drinking and drink was promoted but once when dulan bath was inside a barber shop she came across this magazine the journal march you see the magazine had a picture which lighted something in the cognition of uh, rulan bath the picture had a young black uh, soldier saluting the french flag you see it is to say there is no racial discrimination in the white colonies it is a blatant lie it's blatant lie so by creating myths you are surrounded by modern myths this myths can be fabricated this myths instead of really serving as a manual really serving as a usage day it for a common man to be informed on the do's and don'ts this myths may serve as demagogues who is a demagogue a demagogue is a public speaker who has a hidden agenda with this hidden agenda to promote this hidden agenda the demagogue uses his uh, rhetoric to mislead the people in the direction which he has desired them to move so myths can be fabricated it's an interesting book i recommend for all of you to read you see the myth the structure you see everything will tell you will promote a particular kind of value very very subtly for example you have here on the screen the munro thomas munro statue which you can easily find everywhere this statue is in chennai tamil nadu uh, india south india you see this statue if you see this statue what happens here you see there is a heart the heart is a male symbol you see the heart is a male symbol and see the position of mandro sitting mahot mounted very erectly sit so this erect stance is actually the stance of power like henry the 5th the statue of henry the 5th in shakespeare's play the description of henry the uh, prince hall in henry the fourth part 1 like a young colt you see like a vulture freshly bathed newly bathed you see descending from heaven and mounted on a hart how powerful the hart the man sitting on the hart appear and the sword the sword he holds that symbolizes the male power so the white male colonizer myth the white power the male power you see the male colonizer the male power the male became a symbol of power colonizer as in religions you see you see we have as in bridal mysticism in bridal mysticism god is the only husband god is the only man a male figure all of us all of us whether it is andal a female poetess or bharadiyar a man with a curled mustache all of us are female figures god is the only male figure the same is with christianity in the western culture you can see in tamil you see manavalan they would say god god is my husband god is my husband you are all wives 
you are married in faith to God. Married in faith to God. You find in the short story, young good man Brown. Brown is married to faith. You see, Brown is married to faith. And even though Brown Day represents an every man, in fact, that is a female figure susceptible to all temptation that is recapturing the Eve myth, you see. So the white male colonizer, that is where, you see, the Jamaican cultural theorist, you see, pointed out culture is not just to study and appreciate. It is not an empty slogan. We don't have, we don't need, in fact, the culture corpse. Culture is very much in our living. You see, culture need not be promoted. Culture does not need a corp. If there is somebody who monitors like the Monroe seated on an elevator So from above, the monitoring force, like Uncle Sam, you see, by God himself, Jews ex machina, God from heaven, watching us, the overseer, you see, when this culture, when this white culture dominating us, Umberto Eco, in his famous book, Serendipities, Serendipities, in a chapter titled Language and Lunacy. Language and Lunacy. Lunatic Lunacy. Madness. Language and Lunacy talks about various ways in which the colonizer's culture can leave impact on the colonized culture. When these two cultures meet, there are many different impacts. The very normal and positive impact could be cultural exchange. But generally what happens when the land is colonized, when two cultures meet, we too have cultural exchange programs. That is meeting of two cultures. It is not one culture oppressing the other culture. One culture forming a hegemony, one culture becoming the ruling class and the other culture is subjugated. When it happens, what happens? The colonizer either pillages the culture of the colonized. Whatever is good in the colonizer's culture is stolen by the culture of the colonized. Sometimes there is cultural anarch, cultural anarch, the white culture, English, the white literature, British literature, or American literature, or Greek literature, or Indian literature, or literature written in Sanskrit, or literature written, written in Tamil, whatever you say, whatever you say, or Hindi as a language, that is dominant. Then they promote the colonizer's culture. You see, anarchizes the colonized culture. How do they do it? Are all the uh, people from the colonizer's land or colonizers? No. There are people like you and I. There are good people who don't want to interfere with others. Like the poet the story, short story writer Purmay Pitan would say, you see, I am a Tamilian, but I wouldn't even blow my breath uh, to, into the premises of a non-Tamilian. You see, in, in Muchu Tamil, Anal, in Muchu Katre Kuda, Nan Inurun Mail, Nan Udamate, that kind of sanctifying the privacy respecting the other person's privacy. There are so many people, Europeans, everywhere, there are so many people who respect others, who, like Jung or Jack Lacan,
Khan would say Dadar is actually defining the self, defining the self, the self and the other. Even if they are binaries, they need not be opposites. You see, it is like dialogic. We can coexist. It is possible. It is possible. There are people. So it is not that all the whites, all the Americans, all the Latin, Hebrew, Roman, Greek are all aggressors. But how these people are convinced, common man is convinced, like Hitler, convincing the entire Europe of European supremacy, even something directly opposite was happening right before his eyes during the Olympics in Munich, where Jesse Evans won the black, won the medals. You see, how Hitler was able to promote, you see, it is like a Louis Althusser would say, Louis Althusser would say, it is not just that the uh, repressive state authority like police force, military can subjugate others. There are also ideological state apparatuses. I, yes, ye, in this sense. You see, ideological state apparatuses, apparatuses, like literature, like religion, like religion, like the fabricated culture, who would promote everything, the color, the language, the literature, you see. So, this Stuart Henry McFly Hall, the Jamaican cultural theorist, reminded us, culture is not just to study and appreciate. It is the critical site of social action and intervention where power relations are both established and potentially unsettled. I came across an excellent title from Dalit literature. The title, Tamil Dalit literature. The title read, reads as Mayam Kalaikum Vilimbugal. Mayam means center. Kalaikum means blurring. Vilimbugal Margin. It is not just the center pushing certain things to the margins. It is also the margins which would decide the center. So it is a critical site of social action and intervention where power relations are both established and potentially unsettled. Or else, what would happen? You see, the main power the white power, you see, then there will be an action and a reaction. The cult and the revisionist cult. If the hero was always riding a white horse, then hero mounted on a white horse becomes a cult, then there appears a reaction. The hero starts riding a black horse. That is revisionist cult. Like democracy, culture is not a fixed entity. When it becomes a fixed entity, it becomes a cult. It becomes religious. R E L I G I O S E. Like religious, it becomes religious. That is why we have carnivals. You see, these carnivals try unholy alliances. For example, the Christmas celebration in a campus or on an educational campus where a student is masked as Santa Claus, the student can dance his way to the head of the department and pull the head of the department and force him to dance and the head of the department would even happily dance with the student. Unholy alliances, the world upside down, carnival, like Mikhail Bakhtin states, the carnivals are there for us to time and again test if a culture has become a cult. So when there is a cult, there automatically appears a revisionist cult. Like that, if there is a culture, then there appears. If a culture becomes a cult, then there appears subculture. 
the subculture should not be taken as a subordinate culture like postmodernism cannot be just considered as after modernism it should be taken as a reaction against modernism <clears throat> the difference between ana and counter reaction you see so postmodernism is a reaction against modernism like that subculture is perverting the culture you see subculture is subverting the culture at the extreme you break you see democracy is a process an icon or class is the one who breaks anything which becomes an icon if you ask him where is the alternative she would say that is not my business she would say that is not my business for example judith butler talked about female gaze this female gaze was a reaction again and male gaze it was so clearly so smartly so clearly pointed out described by the media analyst uh, laura mulvey because in the traditional exhibitionist role women are always fixed you see they are in the traditional exhibitionist role women are simultaneously looked at and displayed for strong visual and erotic code many of you would have read the breast stories written by mahasweta devi beyond the breast you see what is there you see choli ke beeche you see it is not just as the choli ke beeche kya hai uh, has been used as an erotic code by bollywood popular cheap culture maga seta devi has beyond breast you see you see what is there you see what is there she used she wrote three stories which are today hailed as breast stories you see and like the laura mulvey pointed out that <clears throat> the male gaze there are three levels the male director deciding the angle the camera the camera like crosso was saying there's always a camera there's always a camera there is a phenomenology you see the subject from the given position perceiving an aspect of the object so only the strong erotic aspect of the female was visualized of course the movie still which i have given in the top of the um a ppt the man the white man standing there is not an aggressor but still even the good man has the privilege there he is a good character but still even the good man has the privilege the male privilege the privileged white you see so as a reaction against that came female gaze and later on the queen of psychology the queen of psychology lara yetinger you see braka sorry braka yel yetinger you see she promoted beyond male gaze the matrixial gaze you see which insist on trans subjectivity you see it talks about the fragility and inclusiveness it extends beyond the visual realm to touch sound movement to make a meaning she is alive today and she is the queen of psychology you see this myth such myths you see here is you have here you have the popular very successful hollywood film of yester era independence day which was the universal success which was for universal audience not only for a uh, audience of various a uh, range of a uh, various spaces but also audience of various ranges of age groups you see how carefully the film independence day promotes 
the culture and the culture within culture. You see, they, like the cowboy myth, like the American Adam myth, you see, the explorer myth, the frontier west myth, Independence Day presents America as the super cop. It is a savior of the world. But even there, the white president is flanked by the white and the black. Both these white and black who help the president are great actors in real life. The black is Will Smith, you know. The white is Jeff Goldblum. The, I would say, the full-mouthed Jeff Goldblum and the foul-mouthed Will Smith in that film. But see that the role they are playing, the black plays the role of a normie man and the white plays the role of a technocrat. So the white is a brainy guy and the black is a brawny guy. So even there is a subclass in the culture itself. So we break this subculture, breaks because our children have been taught very subtly ideological state apparatuses. It need not be just Shakespeare promoting colonizer Smith in the Tempest or Shakespeare as an Elizabethan promoting it, the, the British Empire or Alfred Law Tennyson or the American writers. It is not only that, like the Greek and Roman writers, not only that, it can enter even through comic series like Tarzan or Phantomus. You see, that is why we have to be very careful. We have to analyze, deconstruct myth and culture as a compilation, as something which is made of many myth themes. And we have to understand that these myths, the culture, may have evolved naturally, accepted by all, spontaneously in the process of evolution of a society or a civilization. Or, dangerously, they may have been fabricated by a set of people, a caucus, an elite. So, it is for us to deconstruct the myth. We should not take myth or culture as a cult. We, the layman as well as the cultural studies expert, are affected by culture and myth. We are living very much amidst them. So we have to analyze them, understand them and position them, position ourselves. Nothing is essentially unchanging. If life is a flux, then naturally culture and myth are also to be flux. We must have the broad mind to accept that, analyze that and tell, share it with our fellow human beings because culture means not only to cultivate or to protect but also to share. Cultures, collier means not only to protect, not only to cultivate, but also to share. So we have to share our ideas. There must be space for all of us to share, to discuss, and evaluate. And there must be meeting of various cultures, various views. That is what true, free, true freedom is. And I am very happy for this opportunity to use it. Here are some of the references which you can find. You see, later on the organizers may send some of the works which I have given in the reference section, which I enjoyed. Which I enjoyed. And I have used it. You see, see there in my thanks, in my thanks note, there is a canyon. The space is vast. I cannot do absolute Justic to it with a given one hour. I have already taken one and a half hours. Um, but I think I have shared as a true, uh, 
truly respecting culture and the original meaning of culture i have shared some of my views with you thanks for your patience and if there were any technical uh, hooks technical hitches um, please forgive the uh, <laughs> forgive the organizers you see technology is one such thing so this webinar may have also taught us nothing can equal the teacher inside the classroom <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much now over to the host if you have questions you can send the questions uh, to the uh, okay. share the questions share the questions in the live chat and i can answer uh, i can try to answer these questions you see i always tell my students that at a primary level of education you are trained to answer the questions asked but at a higher level of education you must be trained uh, to question the answers given so if i know the answers you will be benefited if i don't know the answers for the questions you ask i will be benefited because i will be uh, promoted i will be encouraged to read further and explore the realms of knowledge thank you once again Questions are there. Am I am I visible to the audience now? No. Am I visible to the audience? Yes. We can see the new things of new dimension. Yeah, I see. Just listen. which asks uh, to define the difference between myth and archetypes myth and archetypes see myth in itself is a process as i have already told you you see archetypes there are certain templates in our mind we have such templates for example who a man is who a woman is what is good life what is education these have been promoted from the early times whereas myths are emerging it is always a process these myths are promoted by folklores legends and epics the folklore belongs to a common man and when this folklore becomes an epic the folklore is taken into the custody of the ruling class the elite whereas these archetypes need not be shared need not be in public view as shared among all people these archetypes are very much within us within us that whereas myth becomes a story which is documented recorded and read whereas the archetypes are secretly whispering within us thank you so much
there is an excellent question from um, Sunita Rao. It asks, can I comment on revisioning, revising ethics in popular culture? Popular. That's an excellent question. This is what I mean by progressive. An epic can be retold. It has been being retold. We must remember that the very emergence of epic into the form which we have today was a process. Was a process. Epic began in oral tradition. Imagine, ask how one poet, whether it was whether it was Homer or Valmiki, could have recited thousands and thousands of lines in one go to one set of audience. You see, even Peter Brook in modern times took seven hours to give an abridged version of the full Mahabharata. That is a different story, you see, with international casting. But he too was um, dominated by this uh, racial um, uh, discrimination. For example, he had a French, a British for Arjuna and a Shaolin monk for Dronacharya and more than that, he had a black for uh, Bhima's role. This is where myth plays a very important role. Now, uh, recently I read, you see, um, Yiranda Moolam, the second place, Second place, a retelling of Mahabharata from Abhima's viewpoint. From Bhima's viewpoint, so revising the myth, retelling the myth. You see, not only myth, any story, any story, seeing it in a different light and in a different viewpoint is very important as a cognitive exercise and a cultural practice, you see. That will give us uh, an equilibrium. Nothing is sacred. Nothing is sacred. I tell you, as, as epics started in the oral tradition, you see, from sage to sire, from teacher to student, from the narrator to the listener, it would have been orally transmitted. And as ages uh, progressed, the epic should also have progressed in its own way, you see. Today you have even rev revisionist cult, I say, you see. For Ramayana, you ask many questions, viewing Ramayana as a, as, as a clash between two races, you see, the Dravidian race and the Aryan race, and there are culture, like Rameshwaram is a place where Rama has made, constructed a linga to uh, worship and appease the wrath of Lord Shiva who was so well worshipped by Ravana, you see. So there is a space for all of us to revise, discuss. There must be a space. Spaces are not given. Spaces ought to be demanded and retrieved if they are lost even. So epics are being retold time and again from various viewpoints. I think it is my uh, respectable student Manjula Chandrasegaran. I think so. Manjula Chandrasegaran asks, all myths and archetypes being replaced by stereotypes in the current world. Yes, yes. They are replaced by stereotypes. These stereotypes, remember, remember, in, even in language, even in language, there is a language called male language and female language. Even in language. I may be a teacher, I may be, I may claim myself to be a feminist, whatsoever, whatsoever, but in one film, when an actress who is well uh, admired by me, Nayantara, 
used the snappy language, the snappy language, you see, uh, shut up in a colloquial expression, shut it, shut it, she spoke it in Tamil, uh, those who know Tamil can imagine the language now, when she spoke that language I was shocked, you see, because women have been stereotyped, so many myths, like that, like the Thali has been stereotyped, you see, the chapel has been stereotyped, human beings are also stereotyped, you see, gods are stereotyped, you see, the mythological study says in the miasma of mythification itself, the true nature would have been blurred. Now they use it for their convenience. The elite, the Illuminati, the carcass, the cabal, you see, these people make stereotypes. This is a question from Nitya Shri. It's not a question, it's a response. <laughs> she, uh, she has expressed her appreciation. appreciation. And uh, here, a question from Sanil Kumar Pierce, which asks, what could be the cultural remodification in the post-pandemic era, is there any myth formation based on epidemics and pandemics? True. The earliest, the earliest um, tragedy, one of the earliest tragedy was born based on a pandemic. You see, can you guess what it is? Oedipus. Oedipus begins with a pandemic. A pestilence-stricken multitude. Pestilence-stricken multitude. You see, yes, every natural disaster, every moment of crisis makes us introspective. Definitely, there is going to be a pandemic culture. You see, for example, not only in the East, everywhere, by now, people have started uh, so people would have stopped shaking their hands, I, I presume. As we do, uh, as we do salute with our palms joined together, they may nod their head, you see. So the personal hygiene, and we, we remember, uh, we will remember one thing, uh, post-pandemic era, you see. Ultimately, there is no remedy for, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't care, if I heard the feelings of some, there is no remedy for, there is no life without disease, without sickness, without ailments. Humanity will provide if it survives along with the disease. So what is most important today is immunity. They have started again talking about herd immunity, herd immunity. So personal hygiene, personal strength are very important. That would be a major change. We will become very introspective, sitting inside a room in, in solitariness. We would, have be, we would have become introspective. We would have asked what we are, whether true or not. I, I saw in some of the, uh, on some social media, money on streets, money on streets. It's not that if you have money, you can buy everything. You cannot even protect yourself if you have money. You have to be strong. You have to be immune. And every disaster, in every disaster management, humanity evolves understanding its true, if I can use that expression, divine nature. That is where the betrayal happened today in India. I don't know about the world outside. The, the, the migrant workers, they were, betrayed. they were betrayed. You could see them returning in exodus to their homeland. People asked me, why should they go? Why should they go? We can give them, we can give them food. No. The betrayal is of a different kind. 
like the immigrant writers who are settled in Europe, their children thinking that they are Europeans, they are Americans. When there is a problem, immediately the Europeans would have called those children, you bloody Asians, you bloody blacks, you brown bastards. They can even call them so. Like that, the immigrant workers returned. You see, when they returned, we asked them, what do you have there? Only since you don't have anything there, you have come here. Why are you returning now? But the only answer is, you return to your home, you return to your place, not only for food. You return to your place because the place is yours. The place where you want to die, whatever you are. This is a new, this is a new dawn in an era of globalization where we would have sung the song Yadum Mure Yavarum Kelir. Maybe globalization is possible. Maybe universalization is a good thing, but still, like Marxist philosophy is saying, a man is in his fixed time and space. He can be universal. He can even be eternal. You see, but he it is also he is also she is also fixed in a time and place. And this is your dawn, your cognitive awareness, your light lit in the darkness, like Claude Levi Strauss says the light lit in the darkness we know the value of our space we should have the sense of belonging are we going to spit again on the street like this this is a question are we going to spoil our body or are we going to return to the integrated icos the primitive wisdom which ought to be taken that is important that will be the past the post pandemic Cultural revolution, I think. Uh, this is a comment and question from my distinguished alumnus and uh, head of the uh, department, uh, Dr. Raju from Yadava College. I am very happy to receive a question from my students again. You see, I should dedicate this entire uh, program, I should dedicate this entire program to the teachers, the numerous teachers who made me a good student and the numerous students, thousands of students who made me, if I am right, a good teacher, a good teacher. So here is a question from Dr. Raju. Every human society possesses a mythology which is inherited, transmitted and diversified by literature. Sir, what is your comment on this? Yes, yes, yes. Because your culture is your document. Your myth is a document. Our interpretation may go wrong or right. You see, we may have we may learn, we may accept so many aspects of other cultures, but still our culture is arts. Our language is arts because our language, our culture, our myths are where our history is. If we forget history, there cannot be a present. You see, talking about tradition, T.S. Eliot says, tradition is not in just the past. Tradition is in the presence of it. He says, like that, the culture alive today has ours. You see, ought to be nurtured, ought to be nurtured. But at the same time, we should be ready to include and we should be adaptable. That is why we say we must be inclusive as the last slide told us. You see, the last but one slide told us. You see, Braca Yettinger talks about inclusiveness. You see, Stuart Hall talks about culture is not an essence. Identity is not an essence. Identity is position. So we must check, preserve, and remake 
Thank you, Dr. Raju. Rowan, sir. Here is a question from, again from uh, my beloved uh, student, Rogan Savaributtu, uh, a distinguished alumnus, a doctor, the doctor of philosophy, a professor himself, who has worked in many reputed institutions. Uh, he asked the question, is there any purpose to reread a myth? If so, which reading is correct? Isn't Rereading a myth similar to rewriting history, and isn't rereading a political exercise. I must tell you that man without politics is an animal. There is politics in everything. Everyone reads it from her or his perspective. Myths like should be rewritten. We cannot even say that history is full of facts, absolute facts. History is also written by a, a man or a group of people. I still remember that back in the early 21st century when Romila Thapar was asked to write the, a sequel to the two-part history. She refused. Because she thought, she surmised that she would be compelled to write the things which she was not convinced of. You see, you all know Ramila Thapar and her history of India. You see, and she refused to write a sequel to that. You see, so history can be his story, her story. You see, so how many histories are there? Do we have any single history? Can history of India can be take can history of India be taken alone from Gandhian view? Can't it be taken from a uh, communist view, from the view of Ambedkar, from the view of Periyar? Once Periyar asked in a Congress meeting, he was a congressman then, original thinker. That's why I always respect him. You see, if allowed, I may make him a myth. Unfortunately, to earn his wrath, you see. Periyar once asked in a public meeting facilitating Gandhi who was uh, undergoing fast and to death, Periyar said, asked this question. In those days he was not Periyar, he was just Ive Ramasami Naikar. So he had his own language. Uh, Sriman Mahatma Gandhi Avargal, revered Mahatma Gandhi has taken up fast and to death. In Tamil he spoke uh, and I pray to God Almighty uh, for the success of his uh, an atheist uh, Periyar in those days said that he prayed to God Almighty that uh, the fast and to death of Mahatma Gandhi uh, should uh, get its mission accomplished of liberation and self-reliance. You see, Gandhi would undo his fast soon. God will bless him, he said. But he continued his argument with a vibrant question. He first asked what freedom means? What is independence, he asked. If a nation, if India is ruled by an Indian, can it be called independence, he asked. If a citizen rules his nation, can it be independence? If so, why Russians are revolting? Russia is ruled by a Russian. Why are they so periyar in his tip phone theory, phenomenology, so on and so forth. That truth, the history, the meaning, the flux. Thank you so much, this uh, Dr. Rohan Savarivuttu. Typical of yourself. Thank you so much. Very good afternoon. So you might have all enjoyed. Uh, before having a formal vote of thanks by email, uh, I couldn't welcome the chief guest. Some more.
of you might have not heard the cloth mattress get delivered by me in the beginning uh, so i was cautiously Ruben MB, uh, who has given us necessary guidance, motivation, support in organizing this wonderful webinar. I also want my sincere gratitude. To the captain of the Great American. Uh, the help rendered by the technical team. Uh, especially uh, Mr. N. Vettivate, Mrs. P. Malarvili, Asmund of English, Mr. Vengade, all the technical team members, Mr. Ramar and other student volunteers who have come forward in this pandemic uh, period and offered their guidance and support in uh, conducting this wonderful webinar in a successful way. So, uh, due to paucity of time, uh, already it is one o'clock. So, uh, it has been already two hours. So, we couldn't accept uh, any more questions you can buy uh, shared by the technical team in Anjak Digital uh, in Anjak Digital throughout the year so you can make use of it and uh, please remember to submit your feedback forms by 2 p.m. to 25 27 May 2020. Hope you have enjoyed it so much for all the participants.